Right. Hello, hello, and welcome everyone. Um, thank you for joining us. We'll get started here in just a moment. Uh, the webinar today is Innovate Talent Management and Improve Hiring Success with Job Benchmarking. Uh, and we're just going to let folks come on in and, and then we'll get started. So welcome. Thank you for joining us. All right, welcome everyone. Thank you for joining us. We'll get started here in just a moment. All right, that moment is now. So hello everyone. Thank you for joining us today. My name is Anissa Avon, and this is part of the best practices in HR series of webinars. Um, the summit today is all about recruiting, hiring best practices and using technology, um, which is what today's conversation about is about. It's really about leveraging um, science and technology along with hiring best practices in order to innovate your talent management and improve hiring success and job benchmarking. Um, so I am eager to get started. One little piece of housekeeping that I want you to know about is you're here spending your time with us. Help us make it real and important and relevant to you. So if you have a particular um, idea in mind or challenge that you're looking to overcome or a question about how these best practices may relate to you and your organization specifically, don't hesitate to use this session as your personal coaching opportunity. So we look forward to hearing your feedback and to learning more about your organization. So um, let's move right along. So innovating talent management. My name is Anissa Avon, and I am the founder and CEO of Turnkey Coaching and Development Solutions. We are an enterprise learning and development solution provider. We have um, highly skilled trainers, coaches and organizational development consultants in every major metropolitan area in the US and in key hubs globally. And our work includes everything from strategy work with executive teams, all the way down to targeted employee development, competency <clears throat> development, and let's see, and frontline manager, mid-level manager development, etc. This last year, um, we've also added a few technology components to our both our diversity, equity, and inclusion program, as well as our leadership development program. So um, if you like anything about what you hear, you'd like to learn more about how we might be able to support your talent development initiatives, do give me a call. Um, so now I'm very pleased and excited to introduce you to my colleague, Roger Blaker. Um, Roger and I have 15 years of peer to peer working together in this space. We first started um, working together way back in 2006. It feels like a lifetime ago, especially after this long year we've just endured. But I want to just give you a couple of highlights about Roger. Um, Roger has 5,000 plus coaching hours and training hours under his belt. Um, one of the most unique talents that Roger brings to the table is his ability to ask a lot of curious questions and then assimilate that into this really customized bespoke solution for his clients, which is why this conversation around talent um, hiring best practices and innovating talent management um, is so timely uh, and why he knows so much about this topic. So there are other aspects that I'd love to, to have Roger share uh, about himself and, and what you're going to learn today. Well, thank you, Anissa. Yeah, um, welcome, everyone. I'm glad that you're on the call here. It really is an honor to be able to, to speak to things. And, and it's really easy for me to, um, to, to enjoy doing that, especially about something I have a lot of passion about. And this is definitely an example of something that really matters to me. Um, a little more depth to my background. I'm, I'm, I'm a leadership executive coach. I'm uh, educated in that area. I'm certified through the coaching federation. Um, but before that, I was actually in the corporate 
um, environment. I um, start out actually as a software developer and not too long after that, I was promoted into positions of leadership and those kept growing and extending out. Eventually uh, navigated into project management and there I uh, set for my PMP and qualified for those things. So my point about that is, is I have a lot of experience uh, from my years in corporate uh, with the challenges uh, that what I wanna speak to today because I experienced it myself personally. I was on uh, two sides of this, um, sometimes not being the right set for the skills that maybe I had, uh, but then the hiring challenges around this. And that could have been a number of ways. As a project manager, there's a lot of dotted line responsibilities and really coming to understand from just practical experience about the challenges around be able to find the right people to put on the bus, but also the right seats on the bus. And so that's what I'm going to speak to a lot about today. Um, it is about the um, hiring process, but also succession planning plays in this also. So it's those skill sets necessary for a person to do um, either being promoted positions or actually changing positions within a company. And how do you how do you deepen the qualification to make sure that you're finding the right match for the person? Uh, some assumptions to make uh, in many cases that people can be highly educated, be highly certified in whatever the things are the fields are in. They could be motivated. They could be high, highly skilled, experienced, all those kinds of things. But that's just part of the process. Uh, it's not necessarily everything that's a fit. So what I want to do is I want to kind of step into the situation that some of the problems we have. And then the whole point is, is what can be done to maybe enhance this quality of performance that we're not talking about necessarily uh, bad employers or poor performance, all those, those show up, but are those people that really could be qualified, but maybe the biggest issue is about what the position is and what it calls for within a company and maybe how you navigate that more cleanly. So starting with situation where I think people, especially in HR happens every day this way, you have people that just quit. And a lot of times you don't get a lot of information why uh, they just go away. Um, another part is you have pre, you have people that create tension on teams. That could happen for a number of reasons, uh, but I'm going to speak more specifically that some of that could come around because of a person that's not challenged the way that the job calls for because there's a mismatch in some of the skill sets or what's required or whatever. And sometimes when people get those things, they maybe complain a lot. Uh, and we're not here to talk about or criticize people's actions, but let's face it, we all kind of been encountered these situations ourselves. And so these things can occur and it's not because we're talking about a bad person. We're talking about something that's other than that that's causing a problem. Then you have the right, not the right skill sets, but for the position. And that's some of what I've already talked about. And then you have expectations that don't match the job. That could be the person in that position that their expectations are not being met because it could be that that job has not been really that clearly defined. And it could be that the KPIs for it, and I'll cover more of this in a minute, uh, are not really stated clearly where we're able to identify the right person for that job. So that's some of the things you run into. <clears throat> I'm gonna go ahead and talk a little bit about job matching now, some of the challenges here, because what do you have? It could be a square peg trying to go into a round hole. So if they're not a match, you have uh, stress that uh, they don't meet the requirements of the position. You have conflict between them, the position needs, some of the things I've already stated. It creates conflict sometimes with coworkers uh, because some of the other coworkers could get frustrated with somebody and vice versa. You have high abs higher absentees because if people aren't motivated, those things can occur and a higher rate of turnover. And I really want to stress here that we're, let's assume we're usually talking about people that are, that are motivated, qualified people. They're not, not necessarily those troublemakers, those gossipers, which we know are in the company. We're talking, let's just talk about their people that some of these things may show up because of just not having the right motivated situation for the right job tied to the right person. So Roger, on that note, um, on the job matching, I want to um, also point out that these are leading indicators of when a person isn't a good fit, even after the hire. 
Um, yes. Later, you're going to talk a little bit about um, how to make sure they're a good fit pre-hire and yeah, how it that's is. That's where we're going. Mm -hmm. Exactly. You're in these interviews and you just are wowed by someone. You just know this, this person's going to be a great fit for our culture. And so oftentimes a hiring manager will just put them in that position you're going to share with us how to prevent these indicators, which will mm -hmm. be a reason for a departure of someone that otherwise could have been a great hire if they were in the right position. Is that right? Yeah. And I, that's a great point, Anissa, because that's something that I wasn't thinking about so much when I put this together, but you really had a key thing that I experienced and I've had this stated many times to me and I know people in HR had this happen. Certainly managers do. Um, we, we all have biases. We're never going to get rid of them. And what we're looking for is some tools that maybe help us counter our biases to give us a clear definition that takes that emotional part out of it. Because oftentimes what happens, you have a manager, they identify with people that have um, things that match their styles, what they're just, and we'll cover some of the different types of assessment sciences. And they'll hire because that they like that, um, as opposed to somebody, maybe they're interviewing them process and there's a little bit of an agentist feeling and everything. It may be that all's going on there is because that person, their behavioral styles, their things like that don't align. And that leader is not very comfortable with that as opposed to having a tool to look at and say, wait a minute, does the alignment for the requirements of the job match this benchmark we've done? If it does, I need to set that what's going on with me aside maybe and examine this a little more deeply. So great point, Nisa. Does that, does that make sense to you? It does. Okay. Thank you. Um, all right. So now then let's go into this whole thing about the cost of turnover, just to kind of state things that I think anybody that's been in positions as a leader in a company or an HR understand these things. So you have direct cost of training benefits to payroll. There's things there that that happened because the turnover is very, very costly. And there's been numbers run on it to where I think sometimes, especially depending if there's a more in-depth uh, skill sets and training required, it could be two couple of years worth of salary that cost the company just in turnover. Then you have stress and support departments. And I'm thinking about some of them like your HR, your training teams, their peers, um, the support departments, those kinds of stresses can happen from there from that turnover or before the turnover, just because a position is not a right fit for somebody, they're not really aligning up and meeting the expectations. Then you have low morale from the current team that's struggling with somebody because there's a lack of a fit there. Um, you have stress of supervisor's time. Then stress on the interview process team. Uh, the more turnover you do and uh, the more disruption, there's more people that have got to do part of the interviewing process. And there's other costs here, and I think these are key. Now, these can be different reasons why, but then you have this disengagement non-performers. Uh, so briefly, you may have non-performers that really are not motivated to do the job. Um, you're going to have those probably regardless, uh, but uh, many times that non-performer, again, is not necessarily a fault of theirs or even the hiring organization. It just was not a good fit. And therefore, this person becomes more disengaged and is not performing at the level because they simply are not matching the requirements of that position. And it may be they're, they're completely talented to do it. They, they may be smart enough. They may even have certifications that align to it. But if that job is not really clearly defined, there could be some key pieces. And that's what we're going to talk about here soon, you know, the assessment tools that may help eliminate some of those guesses or those things, that you, those blind spots that you aren't able to see. Um, well, this brings uh, up a, a good point that Wendy just shared. And she said, you know, the risk to the employer brand. And I think that um, those of us who are in this hiring um, manager position, right? I think that that's probably something that we're going to eventually be able to put a real number on. Mm -hmm. um, the more we begin to compete for um, the the smaller market of of folks in a qualified candidates in the market, the more important our employer brand is. And if there is, let's just look and see how how fast Glassdoor has grown with 
with every time someone wants to consider a new job or a new company, the first place they go is to look and see, well, what do the other employees say about them? So employer brand is a really big deal. Um, And what I'm hearing you say is the turnover hard cost is just one thing. There is a much bigger Mm -hmm. piece when you look at the the intangibles, the disengagement, non-performers, stress, toxic work environment, and employer brand. Right. That's perfect. Exactly. Because we're talking about many layers here. Um, And I've, I've seen, I've had experience and also being in the coaching industry, like we have been, how many times we've run a situation where we really analyze it coming from the outside. And you look at the people and you're like, these people are smart. They're qualified. They're, you know, we're not, we're not looking at it that there's a lot of negativity. There could be negativity on, but we can start peeling layers back and identify these are good people. There's something else going on here. So it's more than just what we're talking about here, but this is a key piece of, you know, how you make sure when you're doing your upfront thing of hiring, are we making sure that we're really aligning, aligning people to what they're, what we're needing for that job has been clearly defined. And then we have a way to benchmark to make sure we're matching those candidates. Now, a couple of things came out of this too, Anissa is, I want to hit this next thing here, uh, something like an estimated, I think that's a low number now, 11 billion lost employee and disengaged and non-performance and turnover each year. I think it's a lot higher than that because I think this number has been extracted a while back. And research is also showing that non-performance can bring down a product productivity of a company by 30%. Um, and I think my experience is a lot of people just deal with that. Yeah. And my point is that we're not here with the keys to the kingdom about how to stop all that. When I'm thinking about this and, and must working on this for some years, I look at the fact if a company can just make a 5% increase in that or 7%, certainly a 10%. I mean, that's a, that's a grand slam. A grand slam. Uh, yeah. Cause I mean, you, it starts adding up in a hurry when you think about loss of cost, again, of the training of hiring, going through all that process. Um, that uh, takes I recall, to be Roger, yeah, that yes. the cost has been of losing an employee after a hire is mm-hmm. it is at least 1.5 times their salary up to two times their salary. Exactly. So if you think about it in terms of for every $60,000 in salary, you are looking at at least mm-hmm. 1.5 times that. So 90,000 in cost. Now you got to start all over again. So in my mind, what you're going to share with us as far as, as the technology is concerned is if you can save one new hire. Mm-hmm. and support them in being a high performer, make sure they're a good fit and retain them, then you've just saved the company around you know, 90,000 for every 60,000 worth of salary. Exactly. And that's real cost and also just lost time cost. Thank you. Yeah, definitely. And so I think now what we're going to step into is where I could, I'm going to go through the process that we've exercised here as far as one of the ways to, to, to actually create the benchmark, this process. So I'm gonna peel back a little bit down in the weeds a little and kind of go through this process. And I wanna set the stage for this up front that, the, that one of the things that really matters about doing this is a company has to be absolutely solidly committed to doing this process because it is gonna be up front, heavy lifting work. Uh, to be able to get a benchmark created. So I'm going to go through some steps that we identify in in the way that we've done it, Um, knowing that a company has to have, the leadership's got to be all in on trying this, at least if nothing else, at least giving a pilot on this, but they really have the commitment in place that the proper level leader that's stating this, that makes sure that the people that are maybe doing this work are actually uh, going to be fully engaged on this game because it is that, it is that serious. Now, the way we do it is we have a facilitation process. So, and, and one of the things I was thinking about, Anissa, that I think one of the real values of having someone outside, someone that doesn't even know this position, doesn't even maybe that familiar with the company besides just talking and meeting and get some general ideas because they're coming in with a complete blank slate and their job is not to figure all out. Their job is to facilitate the team that's inside the organization to do this. So. Uh, I'm going to start with the process about that. So example would be you have facilitation and you want to gen- identify the job. I think some of the I big... Ask you a quick question. Uh-huh. So 
And I'd love to hear from folks um, on the call, you know, what do you believe job benchmarking is? What is it? Does your company do it? Right. So, so help me understand job benchmarking is simply identifying not just the description of the job, not just the job titles or the quote unquote responsibilities. How is it different than a job description when you benchmark a job? That's a great point because that's one of the things that would, you're, you're ahead of me on this. <laughs> okay. You know? All right. and the reason why, because that's a great question, because here's something I've identified and I think is very true many times. I don't think a lot of times there's been a thorough driving out of the requirements and the KPIs for a position. So starting right with it, and I'm not in, in it, it, the skill set it takes to do it or the time it takes to really sit down and investigate it. That's really why I think even if you aren't going to do a benchmark, if you did something like this exercise, and really made sure that you really qualified the KPIs and that for when you go out and post a job placement, that that can maybe even be clear about what's required there. So I'm gonna step even further into that. Another area that I really see a lot of weakness, and again, this is not criticizing people because I think this is very challenging for a lot of us to do, is, is when we have those KPIs, we have that job set that way, then we look at the performance of the people. And when you have somebody that's not aligned in that performance, you're quick to identify that and see if there's something you can do to coach that person along or whatever, and especially have corrective action to take. And I think this is really a weak point in many areas because it takes time, it takes our HR's involvement. How do, you, how do you have something where you're really stating it clearly about what the expectations are and all somebody's not meeting that performance the action you take at the right levels, the right time to see if you can help that person uh, make that shift to it, or if they're not, that you don't wait all that long to replace them. And it could be moving to another position in the job, but also terminating them because I think one time we're really short on doing that because of all kinds of reasons that, that I think start with this. If you're not really clear, you hadn't got that clearly defined in what actions that leader will take to be able to do it the right way, you end up carrying people that are non-performers and things like that. And so that's a leadership challenge. Does that make sense? It does. So that kind of sets the stage for what we're talking about here. So subject matter experts. So one of the things that we do here is we want to collect people that are the high performers in this position. A few of those to bring in as far as this process is going to be facilitated. Probably somebody from HR. The manager of that group probably, and there could be some people that are they're closely tied responsibilities to that job, but you want to have a good set of people. It could be six or eight, 10 people that are going to be the people contributing to it to help to create this benchmark that the facilitator is going to draw out the information. So the, the clear understanding of the job, why the job exists, and that's what the facilitation is about. Without getting too deep into it, one of the things that we've identified that when you come out of this, you should have no more than a max of five KPIs, period. If this job ends up because of other experts and they start coming up with six or seven, it's probably a job responsibility. It's too much for one person to handle. That's kind of a, a bar set from the experience of this. And that's another thing this will help will do. Is this, is this leadership's position or whatever, or the individual, is it really more work than really that one person can handle? And if you drive that out, now you got information there about, okay, how do we, what do we need to do about this position to make sure that we aren't overloading it and having more expectations that are reasonable for anybody to meet? That's one of the benefits that can come out of this. Um, then you, uh, how, uh, you have the let the job talk and define the key accountability KPIs and what I mean by the job talk, that collecting that data from the people that are being facilitated and capturing it. And there's a process I'm gonna get into now about how you arrange it and how you put things together to where you come out with those stated requirements for the job that can be documented now out of this process. <clears throat> and then we have each one of those people that participated in that driving out those KPIs to respond individually to assessments. And there's layers of them. We have a, a four max, but you can do less that can just vary on the position. I don't want to get in all that right now, but the more you have, the more in-depth of the quality of, the, of that challenging benchmarking is going to be. Uh, then you have them, and then we combine them. While we do this, we take all those individuals and we create an aggregate that ends up creating the benchmark. So that's kind of the scientific process without going into a lot of detail about exactly how that works. 
but you come out and I'll speak a little bit more about the different, different sciences we're gonna cover here and cover a little bit of this here in a second. Then you implement the job benchmark. Uh, one of the cool things about this is once you have this benchmark document data there, um, there's also a way that you can create reports out of it that actually provide questions that an interviewer can use as some keys that might help them even deepen the questions they ask a person during the interview process. That's one of the cool things about the reports that are generated out of this. Well, and that brings me to something you said a little earlier that I think um, is important. And that is part of the, this process is that is essential um, is eliminating that affinity bias, right? That subjective Absolutely. opinion. Oh my gosh, you like horse racing too? I'm hiring you. You know, it happens every day. Um, and what you just said is one of the things that a, a good job bench more, with a, a corresponding report can do is provide um, the hiring manager and those other managers who aren't experts in interviewing, how to ask the right questions that match the job, not just about tell me about yourself or tell exactly. me about a recent success or something that you've practiced and rehearsed a thousand times prior to coming in here. So I know you're going to sound really great. These are questions that correlate to the KPIs, to the requirements. Am I, am right. I getting that right? Yeah, exactly. Um, one of the ways that I think really I've seen the most efficient way to do this um, is that the, you know HR goes to a placement service or whatever. And maybe they clicked, you know, they may have 50 resumes, but they go through and they pick a dozen. Mm -hmm. If they go through and qualify for expertise, education, background, and whatever, and whatever screening they may do, they pass those on to the hiring manager. And, um, and it could be more than one person looks at them, but they go through and it could be some of these people that did the, um, did this benchmark process and they review them and they come up and they say, okay, we want to interview these. We want to check these five out. And one way to really optimize this, there may be just a phone interview. You schedule a thing with them just to kind of get a general feel and background of that. They end up picking that out of that dozen. You pick the five you want to interview and you actually do that just a phone interview. You hadn't brought them in yet. At that time, then you may have them do this benchmark or respond to this instrument. And now you've got more information. And that's what I mean. Once you do that, it's going to then spit out a lot of these questions you can use during the interview process face to face. They can use that material. So that's one way to really kind of have it in a step logically that really provides you uh, the process to that. OK, where, where in other words, where where do we uh, have the assessment done? You know, where in that whole process of hiring is the right fit to, to that assessment to optimize? It? So I. Just tell me to hush if I'm asking too many questions. No, sure. Right but now you've brought up another point. You know, there's two things happening that are disrupting how hiring managers, um, the process that many companies have used are now being turned on, you know, upside down. Good news, application tracking systems match a resume to the job so mm -hmm. that you're easily able to filter out, oh, we just got a thousand applications. Wow. Here are the top 20 that actually passed at 85% or above the ATS, mm -hmm. but that's still 20 candidates. What I'm hearing you say is now you can take those 20 candidates and do one of two things. Either one, have a quick call. Tell me about yourself. I want to hear if you're a good fit. Uh, yes or no. And they can take the, the, their own personal assessment against this benchmark and you get another number. And that number says this person is 60% likely to be successful in this job. This person mm -hmm. has the affinity, the skill set, the personality, the competencies, because it does match competencies also. Is that right? Yeah, I'm going to cover those here in a minute. All right. So I'm not, I'm not going to ask any more on that. No, one. no, no. You're doing good. Go okay. Ahead. So, Go on. The, but then, so if you have too many candidates and you're spending too many times trying to go, mm -hmm. yes, no, yes, no. Mm -hmm. And you know, you're not going to get right because you've got 20 open positions. You've got to do this on this process will eliminate the guesswork so that by the time you've called in five candidates, you're looking at all five of these have an 85% or above on the, from the application tracking system. They also have 85% or above on their, uh, their likelihood of being successful in this role. Is that right? Exactly. Yeah, yeah, that's perfectly said. And I'll, and like I said, I'm going to cover the four sciences in a general way here in a minute. Um, and just what you said, I mean, you can imagine uh, the, the 
especially you're looking here where you've had these experts, the people that really perform high in this job. Um, and when you're doing that, there, there's no bias in that. These people are the highest performers. They're the biggest producers, whatever that, that is they're bringing here. And in the end, it's not anything to do with the personality. It's, it's, it's to do with what their expertise are and how people clearly identify that. And then you take it and you capture those KPIs again, the facilitator making sure that they're really putting in words the brief statement each one of those up to five would have that's really clear that everybody says, yeah, man, this is, and because I think a lot of times people go out and try to create the job skill sets to go in and put it into the advertisement or wherever they're going out to do the hire, the recruiting. And they've maybe done that on their own. And when you have a, as you know, when you have a team of people come together, you can draw, the, it could be five brains in a room. It's 20 times the power because of those five brains coming together and actually clarifying the expert, expert, uh, expectations of this job in a clear, definitive statement. Great. So absolutely. Okay. So now what we're going to go into, we are going to step into the four sciences that we cover here. And I'm going to do this in general, kind of general terms to explain each piece of it and break it down a little bit as we go through this. So you have the competencies, which Nisa, you just talked about. Um, you can have like 35 skills competencies uh, to do with leaderships, communication, uh, writing. There's several of them there. Um, and so if you have out of your, um, your benchmarking, out of those SMEs, once they've done their assessments individually and you create that aggregate, then what you're looking for is maybe the top seven skill sets that you want to uh, match out of that 35 to the person that's going to be taking the assessment to compare those two, to see how many of those top seven align to what, what competence this person has. See how, see how that aligns? I do. Like then that. you have behaviors. Uh, this is the kind of things is how the person does the job. It's how I do it. It's how I prefer to work. It's the uh, it's whether I like to do things fast and quick and and have a, a quick turnaround, quick change. I'm really comfortable. I'm energized by change. Then you have certain people that's like a kiss of death. Uh, change they're not comfortable with. Um, and what you're looking for is those behaviorals of how they do the job that align to what this job requires. And there's a there's a hierarchy of 12 uh, in those. And what you're looking for is the top four. How many of the top four this person doing the benchmark align to the top four that's out of the benchmark compared to the person taking the assessment? Then you have motivators or your driving forces. That's the culture of the job and that's the why. Why do I get out of bed in the morning to go to work? What energizes me to do whatever it is I do? The thing about the behaviors and motivators you're going to do those whether this is a good job fit or not. I mean, that's the reality because that's how you function. Uh, and you can see if I'm doing them and they're not aligned to this job, then I'm trying to do them. You can just see the stress that's putting on that employee and that department and, and their peers for this person that's struggling with this. And again, there's like there's 12 type motivators to find and you're looking for the top four. Um, and there's a midpoint, the ones that the mid four you'll use to maybe uh, in, in, in brace into the top four. But again, you look for how those top four align to this person's assessment. The one that's a little more complex, but I'm not going to cover it a lot right now, is the acumen indicator. This is much more of a mathematical science based assessment. And it really, really has a much deeper dive into this person's ability to judgment, their impact on their interaction with the external world and their self-perception and discernment uh, uh, direct, that directly relates to performance. And that one has six, uh, six categories and two, with two sides, the external and the internal. Um, and it measures against um, the overall acronym, but also just that person's ability to manage that. It gives you scale numbers. And, um, it really, really, it's effective for anybody, but where this is gonna, you wanna definitely use this one when you work with senior level leadership positions, whatever, this one here, because this is gonna tie somewhat to EQ um, and therefore it really does show some things up that might, again, there could be coaching questions or interview questions. It doesn't disqualify anybody necessarily, but it gives you some insight about some questions you wanna ask that might, help inform you about what you saw in that assessment. Uh, something that's very key about all of this, 
The ones I'm talking about here are completely bias-free assessments that have been certified through to meet the EOC requirements and the F OFCCP. Therefore, there's not any uh, problems, litigation problems, if somebody feels like there's a bias going on here because that's been legally tried and it, 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 and it doesn't float when somebody tries to use their argument against those. I want to point out that um, probably our HR friends on the call know about this, but that's a really important point. Many companies are still trying to use DISC or MBTI and some of these other personality assessments as hiring tools, and they can find themselves in EEO. See uh, non-compliance and trouble um, for for that. So what you just said is really important. Yeah, because uh, if you step back and think about this, uh, because uh, the assessments here and the organizations that I'm connected with that use this have gone through the next that, that that's been tried by some people to do it, and they they've not they've not passed the sniff test if there's any kind of bias or whatever. And you think about it. You're doing a blind thing of creating the benchmark, which is not tied to any people, any culture or anything like that. It's the job requirements. And then you take this and you align it to that job. Um, and I mean, you could do this thing to where say you eliminate, you eliminate anything about even talking about it. You don't know anything about their history, their background. You don't know the culture. You don't, you don't know uh, lighter skin, darker skin. You don't know anything. And if you took this lined it up, there, it's completely blind. If you look at it purely at that form. Yep. because it's going completely at the qualified of this position. It's um, uh, worth stating that many um, HR organizations inside companies are have set a strategic priority of eliminating uh, biases in the hiring process and um, cultivating a more a greater commitment to their diversity, equity, and inclusion goals. And mm -hmm. one of the key ways to do that is through blind resume audits, um, eliminating first name, last name, yep. uh, and a hiring assessment, because then it's all about fit and it completely eliminates all the biases. Exactly. And this would align that perfectly. I mean, you wouldn't even have to do any interviews. You just take the resume and say, okay, let's just pick the dozen we want. Let's have them do this assessment and see how That's they right. line to the job. And you don't know anything about it. You don't know male, female. You don't know anything. That's Transgender, right. you don't know anything. That's right. Because in the end, that doesn't matter. That's not, that's not the key piece here. So absolutely. Um, okay. Uh, let me see if I can make this thing move again. Uh, what I wanna do is I wanna touch on a few of them here that are, anonymity is the case, but there's a few examples here of people that actually implement this process. So you have a company- I love this part, thank you. Yeah, was losing 50% of new hires during the training program. So they benchmark and, for the, and get the job requirements again, something you know, I've stated very clearly that they got clear on the job requirements. And they identified and brought in the right people as a result of that better. And then they increased their retention by 80%. They have an organization that had 40%, 47% uh, turnover in sales force. And these are the sales and, and the call, uh, call centers are really high turnover areas. So like I said earlier, if you could just reduce uh, some percentage of this, the, the stress on the organization would probably dramatically increase. But they benchmarked and they did the debrief with those with those um, people that through the assessment process to create the benchmark. And they did all that debrief to make sure they really were clear that what they came out with is the right fit from what they did when they did the original facilitation process. And they had zero team turnover in the subsequent 18 months as a result of that. Now, I'm setting real high ones here. But let's just face it. If we had this here and I had a 30%. Uh, increase, you know, just, you know, any number there from what that was would be dramatic improvement. Mortgage company experienced over 300% turnover in the sales department. There's another one of your high volume turnover things. Using the five uh, sales expertise where I'm talking about, you have your expert experts, your top sales people, what it is they do and how they do it and everything. And you capture the facilitation and you use those five of those four, uh, um, assessment sciences to come out with that. And as a result of that, the turnover reduced 250% in six months. That's great. And then the service organization losing 60% of all the new hires during the first 60 days of the job using benchmark tools, changed the hiring process, whichever one of these things we're actually talking about. And after implementation, no turnover for 60 days. 
Those are some examples that that's the kind of the results that can happen if this thing is really, like I said, the commitment in the organization at the right level really takes the time to put this in place. And one well, of the things that, go ahead, Nisa. I was just gonna say a couple of things. Um, uh, the, the process you're talking about combines um, science-backed assessment plus a very specific high performance, uh, uh, high performer input, those subject matter experts, um, mm -hmm. plus the KPIs. So it's a, it's a process that initially you do on an important role that then from there, until that role change, that benchmark is solid for how long? Well, that's a great point. Because I think that I think going through and maybe it doesn't really necessarily have to bring in an outside person to help facilitate it, but the part of the team is still around, say a year or two later, going back and reviewing that and say these up to five KPIs, these job requirements, are they still worded right? Do they line right? What's changed in our industry? What's changed the responsibility of this job? And especially if all of a sudden there is an organizational change or there's a merger of a company, well, common sense tells you it's time to do it again because the requirements based on, you know, it could look on the external thing, like these two companies do the same thing, but inside that company, what's required to do that job could be dramatically different. Yeah. And so, yeah, uh, being aware and staying tuned. And it's like anything about writing up the details of something. And you and I know this, because some of the companies that we've done uh, another type of business development thing on, is they hadn't taken time to document requirements and things like that. And now they've grown, they've gotten very large and they don't have that stuff. It's all in people's heads. And you and I've seen the train wreck that creates. That's right. So it does take that discipline commitment about, okay, what do I need to do to make sure that we're keeping this job viable and energized right by that, that assessment? Because if it starts going off track, now we're actually hiring people again. We're now doing what we did this for to stop. That's right. Right? That's right. Okay. So okay. So imagine what would you do with your time <laughs> if you reduce the time spent interviewing, rearranging jobs and territories, reduce training hours, and soothe frustration of current teams. I mean, just imagine if you just had some of that. I know people in HR love doing what they do, but but I have to believe there are times when it's like, oh my God, can I just stop some of the noise? Yeah. Yeah. Uh, then how would a company grow in advance? Find exact matches faster. And I say exact, I want to use that term loosely because again, I gave you definitions of five competencies of four uh, behavioral styles, four motivators. And then you have those six categories of the, of the uh, fourth um, instrument there. And exact is not worried about that. Matter of fact, I get calls back when somebody does see times they want to kind of talk about a little bit because their scales, there's uh, exact matches, they're close matches, a little more match and there's unmatched. Mm -hmm. And so they want to talk sometimes because I've got quite, you know, quite a few of these are exact matches, but there are, you know, there's a number of them there somewhat. We look at that. We look at that separation in the graph to see how much, and determine okay, this is still a good match, because that's the second criteria: exact and then good. Uh, so it, it sometimes it's worth checking that out. So when I say exact, I just say it's exact for what I'm looking for at this time because it's a whole lot closer than what it used to be. Yep. So I'm going to ask well, a, a question about some of that. Um, help help me um, illustrate uh, the 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 process, right, with those high performers, those subject matter experts, uh -huh. you're bringing those in and um, they're, they're having a conversation, right? They take an assessment that helps them identify, you know, this, let's just take something easy. Um, in fact, I'm thinking of a client who, who did the job benchmarking process. Um, uh, DMS, you may remember. Uh -huh. Yeah, matter of uh, fact, I still get, I still do assessments today. Okay. And that was years ago. Yeah, so I think seven or eight or something. Yeah. Like. Wow. That's fantastic. Great yeah. to hear. So here's one of the things that I recall uh, about this particular situation. So um, a C the CEO um, had really a lot of challenge with uh, hiring someone to be basically his right hand 
guy or gal, right? right. Someone that could duplicate his level of strategic thinking, critical thinking, um, uh, moving on it on their feet, um, see around the corner, you know, what's going to come at us and, and manage multiple projects. And mm -hmm. what I remember is that um, initially he ignored the science, right? There was someone that wasn't exactly. a good fit. And the assess the they went through the job benchmarking process, but he really thought, I know who's going to be a better fit. I'm going to hire this person for this role. I don't yeah. care that she scored a 68. I think she's the right one. It ended up being within I, I want to say four or five months. Hardly any time at all. Yeah, hardly any time at all. And he was so disappointed because he just knew. So after that, he's had that same experience looking at the data and going, but I really want this person, right? Only to go, nope, I'm not doing that anymore. I'm gonna trust the science. And it it's not that the science says who you're gonna, who you need to hire. It's more of a does your opinion of this person's competency map with what the science says is okay. their level of competency, the things that they enjoy, what they're passionate about, their mm -hmm. strengths, weaknesses, et cetera. Uh, I, can, mm -hmm. I don't know if you guys can hear that, but that's my cat knocking on the door. Pardon me. <laughs> yeah. Uh, she's quite insistent. <laughs> so I just had to open the door there. I thought someone was typing. <laughs> <laughs> was my cat? Yeah, that's a little Hello. embarrassing. Um, so what I was going to say about that, and, and then we'll wrap up here in just a moment, is that after that experience, he began to really listen to the science. He yeah. coupled his gut and what he wanted and what he thought were tr was true with the science, but the two together. Sometimes he doesn't hire the one that scores a 90% if it doesn't match his gut gut. Sometimes if his gut says, oh, you know, this 85% is good enough because mm -hmm. I think we're going to be a good culture fit. Um, and that works out. It's when he ignored the science that he regretted it and, and said, that was a waste of time. I just wasted a ton of time training, he did. hiring. It was a painful experience. Process. That's right. That was pretty painful learning. And the thing about it is when we talk about bias, bias doesn't need anything uh, negative. It can, I mean, we, we all know that. We all witness that in our society today. But a lot of times it's biased because, like you said, I really felt good about this person. Yeah. There was something about it. I really, really felt a connection there. And then when I was asking about the job, it just seemed like there was things they were saying. And that's what happened. And, um, and the, 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 the science of the assessment, uh, and they use three of these. Um, not, they don't use the acumen indicator. Um, and it, it and it's because it's a position that those are enough, that those align well enough. And just to give you proof in the pudding, they're still using it today. I did, I've already done a couple few this year. And matter of fact, Lovely. I ended up talking to the manager, a manager of the department, because she wanted to ask me about one they just did. We got on a phone call and briefly kind of went through it. Um, and, I, and I think it was just kind of helping her remind her when she's looking at it, don't get tied up too much if everything's not green. Yeah. Um, because it does color code as the four colors about, the exact, um, uh, let's say I said good, fair, and poor. Um, and so there, and there was no poor on this. So if you give her a chance to kind of unpack some of it, kind of remind herself again, and it's like, okay, that, that qualified her for what she wanted to ask and get the information. So Love it. Love it. So uh, I'd love to hear from you guys. What's your takeaway from today? Um, and Roger, you know, what would next steps be if someone wanted to just have a consultation with you about, mm -hmm. you know, how can I use this in my, uh, in our hiring? Is it going to be a good fit for all companies? You know, what are the costs of this? I know you don't want to answer all of that right now because we're out of time, but how can someone get a hold of you? Um, and, and then kind of recap, if you would, whether someone works with you in this process or not, there's key takeaways that people can take and use in their own um, hiring practices. Well, you know, if you just want to do something like I say, you know, I don't feel like we're as disciplined as we could be as far as really making sure that we get the uh, job requirements defined well. I mean, one thing they could do on their own here is somebody in HR that really is a good communicator and maybe facilitate you got a manager there is aligned with that manager that the manager brings in through four of the people are high performers themselves and things like it. And maybe there's a person in a different department that's really closely connected. Therefore, they're very aware of what, what, what satisfies that other department's need from this area and bring them in and let the HR person interview them to help them drive out 
the KPIs to make sure are they clear? Are they really defined the way? Because if you did nothing else than that, you'd find out, well, yeah, we are aligned, but maybe we're not. But also it helps all those, those, all those people there understand very, very clearly. And, and you want to make very brief statements around those individual requirements. And again, if you end up having, we're going through this and we, we've worked and worked and worked and we've got seven things here. The question is, is that too much for one position to handle? Uh, so you can do that on your own just by having that knowledge to take away. Um, now, as far as with us and everything, Anissa, what I did is I put your information in here because I would suggest that people are interested in finding out more about this, is to contact Turnkey and make that call, call there. And if they just want more information about it, like the cost, or maybe uh, even provide them um, sample reports of what that benchmark looks like. Uh, there's actually a one page document that kind of does a, a schematic of the steps through it. There's things like that would be happy to provide people. That's great. That's great. So yes, absolutely. You can email me, Anissa at turnkeycoachingsolutions.com. I'll put you in touch with Roger. Um, uh, I would love to hear about what you've got going on related to hiring and some of those challenges. If you and your organization are also looking at your hiring practices specifically related to your mission or guiding principles related to diversity, equity, and inclusion, this process could change the game and makes things a lot more aligned and compliant with your real intentions. Mm -hmm. So I look forward to hearing your feedback. I look forward to um, uh, uh, having a, a deeper dialogue about this. Roger, this has been um, enlightening again. It's been a while since we've uh, talked about this. And uh, every time I'm just amazed by um, the potential of this process. Well, I appreciate it, Nisa. I think so too. I think it's one of those things we teamed up well on. So absolutely. I agree. I agree. All right. Thank you, Roger. Thank you, right. Wendy, Thank for you. being here. Everyone, we appreciate you and have a great day. Give us a call.